All right, so please take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Caleb, what book comes before it? <laughs> you knew where Matthew was. I heard you say, I know that one. Yeah. All right, just teasing you. 1 Thessalonians. And our text this morning is chapter 1, verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 1. So you're going to look at that and you're going to say, wow, he's only preaching on one verse? This is going to be a short message. Now, I don't know about you, all of you that are at home, but uh, everybody here is smiling at me um, as if they don't believe me. Well, let's read verse 1, shall we? We read in verse 1 where it says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Well, before we look at it in detail, let's pray. Father, there's so much to learn from your word to us. and Every word has value and an important message to learn. Your word teaches us about you, about truth, about your love for the, for the elect, and about the life of the early believers. Make us sympathetic to their plight and help us to imitate their faith and trust. This letter is from you and to the Thessalonian believers and to believers of all time. So it is also for us today. Teach us today. Strengthen our faith and encourage our hope. In Jesus' name, amen. The first book of uh, Thessalonians, the first verse of the book of Thessalonians identifies that what was written here was in fact a letter, a letter. Uh, the verse gives us three pieces of information which are going to make up our points this morning. The first is the verse tells us who the author is, it tells us who the recipients are, and it offers them some kind of greeting. So the author, the recipients, and the greeting. Now, unfortunately, unlike modern letters that you and I might write, if we do that kind of thing anymore, uh, we would include the date in the upper right-hand corner of the letter, which tells us when the letter was written. But when the uh, apostles wrote their letters, uh, they did not include the date of when it was written. And if they did, it would make it get a lot more easier to, to determine when it was written. Now, it, it's unknown whether Thessalonians or Galatians is the first letter that Paul wrote. Uh, there is some debate on that. The one thing that we know for certain is that Paul wrote Thessalonians after Timothy had returned to him um, and joined him again in Corinth, when, uh, which was about six months after Paul left Thessalonica. Uh, that would date the book of Thessalonians, the letter of Thessalonians, near the end of 50 A.D. So that part we know for certain. The, what we don't know for certain is when Galatians was written. There are a couple of views. There's an early view and a later view. And uh, uh, some feel that Galatians was the first letter and uh, written to the uh, churches that Paul founded on the first missionary journey. Um, and was written either just prior to the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 or just after the Jerusalem Council before Paul headed out on his second missionary journey. Um, <clears throat> so which would make it as early as 48 AD or as late as the spring of 50 AD. Others think that it was written during Paul's uh, third missionary journey when it was said he traveled up north into the province of Galatia and uh, possibly established a church up there, which would mean then Galatians was written in 53 to 55 AD. If you have a study Bible or notes in your Bible, you might uh, uh, see those kinds of things identified for you. It doesn't really matter in a sense, except we're studying Thessalonians and we want to know whether it is the first book or the second book. Um, I tend to accept the early dating of Galatians uh, that he wrote it after his return to Antioch, just after the uh, Jerusalem Council, which would make it early in the spring of 50. So Galatians written early spring of 50, and uh, 1 Thessalonians written near the end of the year of 50 AD. All right, so let's take a look at the author. What does this verse tell us about the author? 
First Thessalonians begins with the shortest and simplest salutation of any of the letters that he has written. Uh, it states that the letter was sent to Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Now, Paul is not saying that Silvanus, uh, or we know more as, as Silas, uh, that uh, Silas and Timothy co-authored the letter. Now, it is possible, and some take that view, but he was certainly writing the letter on their behalf as his co-workers who helped establish the church of the Thessalonians. If you look at verse 2, uh, it says, We give thanks. Look at verse 4, For we know. And verse 6, And you became an imitators of us. So throughout the book, Paul writes uh, in the first person plural to include Silas and Timothy as though it were coming from them all. Uh, but there are three verses in the book of 1 Thessalonians which identify Paul as being the sole author. So look at chapter 2, verse 18. Chapter 2, verse 18. It reads, We wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. So the author uses the first person plural, the first person singular, I, and then puts his name, Paul. So identifying that he is in fact the one doing the writing. Uh, a few verses later in chapter 3, verse 5. Chapter 3, verse 5. Again, the first person singular is used. Look at this verse. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. So again, the, the I identifies that there's really one person writing the letter, um, but uh, on behalf of the others who had uh, labored uh, to, in the church there. Now we know that it was Paul who sent Timothy back to the Thessalonians uh, in his place to be his emissary. Uh, so he, it, he would certainly identify with the I of that verse. The third text is chapter 5, verse 27. Chapter 5, verse 27. So look at that, verse 527. It says, again, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. So here we have the author is, is, uh, is using authoritative words here um, as an apostle to authenticate not only the letter, but to ensure that the letter gets read by all of the believers. And of course, that would again identify Paul. So Paul is the author and he's writing uh, uh, on behalf of uh, Silas and Timothy who were co-workers with him. So why would Paul uh, include the uh, names of his fellow workers, Sylvanus and Timothy? Well, besides that point that I just made, and in the first place, uh, Tim, Silas and Timothy um, had a vested interest in the church because they helped Paul co-found the church. In the second place, Paul is, is establishing, right from the very beginning, a very important principle about the church. And the principle is that he is not the head of the church. He's not Christ's vicar, um, but the church is established on the authority and the plurality of leaders. Um, if it was just Paul, he would say just Paul. But he's saying, no, this is, comes under the authority of all of us. So Paul was the leader, though, among the leaders, but it was not his church. Um, the, the CEO model is not the model of church. The pastor is not running a corporation. He is not the chairman of the board. Um, and uh, when one's ecclesiology sees the church as an institution in any form, um, John Riesinger says, you are halfway back to Rome. And the pastor becomes the un untouchable Lord's anointed. So we, we know a lot about Paul, so I'm not going to go into any details about him, but let's take a look at Sylvanus and Timothy. Just a few things. Uh, first, Sylvanus. Sylvanus is probably the Latin name or the Latin form of the Greek name Silas, which is how Luke refers to him in the book of Acts. We learn in Acts chapter 15, verse 22, that Silas 
along with another man by the name of Judas Barsabas, uh, they were, quote, leading men among the brothers at Jerusalem, unquote. They were elders with James in the Jerusalem church. And James, of course, was the brother of Jesus. Um, they were chosen to take the letter that James wrote, which summarized, summarized, summarized? All of a sudden that didn't sound right. It was a summary, anyways, uh, of, the, um, the, of what was decided at the Jerusalem Council. And James uh, entrusted that letter to Silas and Judas to take to the churches at Antioch and throughout Asia Minor. Uh, we see that in Acts 16, verse 4. So they accompanied um, um, Paul and Barnabas to Antioch. And in Acts chapter 16, uh, Paul chose to take Silas along with him on his second missionary journey. We looked at the details of that a bit last week. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 23 gives us a little additional information about Silas, although it's not exactly certain to what is meant. But it may indicate there that Silas was an apostle. Um, in addition to the 12 disciples who became apostles, uh, there was also some other men, um, and Paul tells us uh, that that meant they had, in order to be designated as an apostle, they had to be witnesses of Jesus, and particularly of the resurrection, uh, in order to hold that standing. Um, and that would, of course, put him on a par with James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul himself. We don't usually know much about, about uh, Silas, but he was a very important leader and certainly a very gifted missionary in terms of establishing churches with Paul. When we come to Timothy, we, all, we are more familiar with Timothy, of course, than Silas. But Timothy occurs in all of the letters of Paul except Galatians and Ephesians. In six of those letters, he is identified in the same way in the salutation as a co-author with Paul. Um, and we also know that he served as Paul's special assistant and representative to all of the churches in Paul's absence. Paul had no problem whatsoever when he left the church to send Timothy to either deal with problems or to, uh, to lay a foundation of teaching and to establish uh, church leadership within churches. So Timothy was a very important person in regards to the follow-up of the missionary work. Now, according to Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 3, Timothy was called a disciple. And he was a disciple who Paul met at Lystra near the beginning of the second missionary journey. Now, what we know about Timothy from the first book, from the, the, the epistles to Timothy, is that uh, his, he had a, his mother was a Jewish Christian, uh, a believer in Christ, and his father was a Greek. We don't know if his father was saved, but he was Greek. We also know from 2 Timothy 1.5 and 3.15 that his mother and his grandmother were very devout and devoted to the Old Testament scriptures and teaching Timothy from a young age uh, the scriptures. So he was very well versed uh, in his catechism uh, of understanding what the Bible, the Old Testament, was about. Of course, he became saved later when introduced to Jesus, and, uh, and he understood more fully what the Old Testament scriptures taught. Now, in the same way that Paul was a, a disciple of Gamaliel, um, and uh, he was a disciple of Gamaliel from a young age, learning in the school in Jerusalem, um, it's very possible that Timothy, by this description of being a disciple, was also a student of a great teacher like Gamaliel. And quite possibly he, his training could have been in Jerusalem as well. Um, that's, we don't know that for certain, of course, but what we do know is he's called a disciple. Not just a convert or a believer, but a disciple. So this sets him above, or sets him out uh, uh, as distinction from the other uh, believers. Um, Acts chapter 16, verse 1, doesn't say that he is from Lystra, although most people will say that uh, Lystra was his home, and when Paul got there, he, was a, he saw Timothy as a young man and, and a potential uh, 
a student of, the, of, of him. Uh, but if you think of it that way, it doesn't really make a lot of sense because Paul gave him an awful lot of authority right from the get-go. Um, but it does say in Acts, chapter, Acts 16, verse 1, that he was there in Lystra. So Paul found him there, a disciple who was there in Lystra. Uh, so he could have been in Lystra as a representative of the Jerusalem church. Uh, and, um, and he could be there helping them to get established and again to lay the foundation work of uh, church leadership and all those kinds of things, which is what Paul entrusted him uh, as he continued in his missionary journeys. So this description of disciple indicates that Timothy, of course, was not a novice, not a novice, but a well-learned person. And, uh, and he may not be as, quite as young as, as, as a lot of us tend to, to think in, in our general understanding of Timothy. Of course, that would be a really good reason, as I said, why Paul would use him in such a few short months. All right, let's come to the second point then of this text. Uh, we looked at the, the authors, now let's take a look at the recipients. So the salutation in verse 1 also specifies who the letter was written to, or the recipients. So look at verse 1 again. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So it says it was written to the church of the Thessalonians. Now the, the Greek word for church is the word ecclesia. And that's a word that we really need to become familiar with. Ecclesia. The English word church actually does not come from this word, but comes from an, another Greek word. Um, but it is often used to, to translate the word ecclesia. I personally think it is a wrong word to use, um, and I'll explain that in a moment. Now, then this word ecclesia is actually a Greek word which was used uh, in a Greek city, for instance, like Thessalonica, um, where they would designate the assembly of citizens who have gathered to deal with city affairs. And it was, it's also used by the, in the Septuagint to translate the Hebrew word congregation. Congregation. Um, this made it, of course, a good word to describe the Christians who assemble uh, together in worship of God. And I'm not disputing that aspect. But this is how the word is used not how the word is defined. And what it actually means uh, makes it a much better choice uh, to describe the Christians. So the word ecclesia is actually a compound of two different Greek words. The first word is ek, uh, and it means out. Uh, the second word is the verb kaleo, and it means to call. So it means to call out. Now the city officials then they would call out uh, the people to assembly to to assemble to do uh, city business. So it, it's it's like me calling up uh, Timothy and saying I'm calling you out to, to come out to uh, meet with me and have a meeting about the church. Uh, and uh, so this is what they would do. And so the the um, the word is is calling out. And not everyone, of course, was called out to the, to the meeting. It was only those who had interest in the business of, of the city. Those who assembled were the ones who were called out. So the meaning of the word is called out ones. So Ecclesia were the called out ones. Now this is a great description of you and I. Because uh, the word Ecclesia here, as called out ones, is referring to regeneration, or our effectual calling. Um, look at uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. It says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. So they were deserting God, and uh, he says, I'm astonished that you're deserting the one who called you. Galatians 1 verse 15, he who had set me apart before I was born, that's Paul speaking, who called me by grace. And Ephesians 4 verse 4, 
Ephesians 4, verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. So again, this idea of being called out. Romans 1, 6. And Paul says that he was given grace to bring the gospel to the nations. And he says that is including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. So we are called by God to belong to Jesus Christ. The called out ones are Christians. They are the saved people and only saved people. They're not called to assemble as much as they are called to be in Christ or to join with Christ or be enjoined to Christ. Uh, one of the things we do is we assemble to worship and to study God's Word, but that's not what defines us. What defines us is that we are called to be in Christ. So this is verified, of course, in our text. If you look again back at uh, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, To the church of the Thessalonians in God. Now, very simply, uh, a literal translation of this would be, to those called out who live in Thessalonica to be in God. You see, that? Uh, uh, that's what he's saying. It's written not to everybody in Thessalonica, but only to those who were called out to be in God. Salvation comes from God and is by grace and by grace alone. God himself is the one who calls us. And he calls us to be in himself and in Christ Jesus. And verse 1 says, To the church of the Thessalonians in God, in God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now grammatically speaking, the preposition in can also apply to Jesus. So it can be read to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, of course, is the way that Paul normally refers to our position in God. Uh, it's always mo most often described as being in Christ. Romans 3.24. Uh, Paul tells us that we are justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we're justified by God, but it is through the redemption in Christ Jesus. Therefore, Romans 6.11 says, You also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So this is, and this of course is the gospel, Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is, is death, um, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this whole concept of being in Christ is also connected to being in God. Uh, we're reconciled to God by means of Jesus Christ. As the result of grace and the effectual call of God through redemption, we are both in God and in Christ. So the word ecclesia reminds us then that we are Christians simply uh, because we are the objects of God's special calling through regeneration. So this is reinforced in Paul's recollection of his time spent in, uh, with the Thessalonians. If you look at chapter 2, verse 12, it should be just across the page there. It says, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls. So who's the one who calls? God. God, God is the one who calls. And what does he call them to? He says, who calls you into his... Kingdom. His own kingdom and his glory. So that's the picture of regeneration, of redemption. So the word ecclesia then basically means Christians. And, and I think that uh, the best way to translate it is, uh, whenever the word is there, is to say Christians. Um, it's awkward to say the called out ones, but the, the called out ones are in Christ. Uh, it is the Christians. Christians are the one whom God has called out of this world and into his kingdom. Now, if you are part of a church that, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> well, I won't go there. <laughs> I was going to say, no, never mind, I'm not going there. So sometimes, though, when we see the word uh, ecclesia um, used, it, sometimes it refers to all Christians, to all the elect, or to all the called out ones. 
Uh, other times it refers to Christians uh, or all of the Christians or called out ones in a specific geographical area, uh, like the Christians living in Thessalonica. It's not all the Christians, but it's all the Christians in Thessalonica. Um, so that's somehow how it's used. But it never means an organization. It, it never refers to an institution. It always refers to people, to Christian people. Either all, all the Christians for whom Christ died or all those Christians in a specific city or place. They were not the church of Thessalonica, but they were the Christians living in Thessalonica. And the, again, the literal translation is there is to the, to the ones called out who were of Thessalonica. We just translated of Thessalonians, <clears throat> referring to the people, but the Greek is actually referring to the city. All right, um, so the goal, the goal here, of course, of the church is not to embrace society or make everybody a member of it, um, but to influence society because we are all members in Christ. All right, let's take a look at Thessalonica itself. There are some things that, that are uh, worth knowing as we before we go into the rest of the book. Thessalonica was, the, uh, was a very important city for the spread of the gospel because Thessalonica was one of the largest cities in the Roman world, and it was a central hub to all of the transportation. So there was a road that came from Rome and came right across to Thessalonica and to the port. And then from there it joined uh, to the roads in Asia Minor that took them up to, uh, to the Orient. So Thessalonica was the, the key city that joined the East uh, and the West and the Orient. It was also one of the chief ports uh, of all of Macedonia, all of Greece. Uh, and it brought in a lot of merchant business and a lot of money. So it was a very important city. It was founded in 315 BC. So 315, about 310 years before Christ was born. It was founded by the king of Macedonia called Cassander. Uh, he named the city after his wife, Thessalonica, uh, who was the half-sister of Alexander the Great. Now you've all heard of Alexander the Great, I'm sure, who was a great Greek uh, general who conquered the, uh, most of the land for Greece. Uh, Thessalonica was also made a free city uh, in 42 BC. So after the Romans had uh, conquered the Greeks uh, in 42 BC, Mark Antony uh, made it a free city. And being a free city, and this is really important to understand, it meant that it had a really um, a certain degree of self-government. They didn't have to go to Rome for everything. It also meant that they would be free of military occupation. Unlike the city of Philippi, which became the retirement community for all of the Roman soldiers in the military, and it was overrun by military people, uh, none of them stayed in or were allowed to stay in Thessalonica. Uh, keep allowing it to, to, um, to remain free of, uh, of a lot of uh, Roman influence over their Greek heritage. It also meant that they didn't have to pay a lot of taxes that other cities had to pay. So you, you would want to guard that relationship with Rome, wouldn't you? Uh, in fact, that put a lot of pressure on the leaders of the city to keep things running really smooth uh, so that they didn't lose that status with Rome. Um, now, historians tell us that the Thessalonica seemed to have a two-tiered form of government, of local government. The lowest level was called a civil assembly, which oddly enough uh, means people who are called out. Okay? This was their civil assembly, assembly, and it consisted of citizens who were kind of, we don't know if they were elected or appointed, but they kind of ran the municipal affairs of the city, um, or minor grievances and things like that. In fact, if you look in, in, in Acts chapter 17, verse 5, uh, Luke tells us there that the jealous Jews incited a mob. The mob would have been made up of, uh, of, of Greeks, uh, 
of the citizens of Thessalonica. And we can assume that what they said was that uh, the teaching of Paul is upsetting things and Rome's going to get involved here if you don't take charge. So they incited this mob and they of course tried to, to bring Paul and uh, Silas and Timothy and anybody else that was with them. It tells us in verse 5, out to the crowd. And that phrase, that verb there, the crowd, is actually referring to this citizen assembly. So they were trying to get Paul and bring them to the citizen assembly and deal with what was going on. But when they couldn't find Paul or Silas, um, verse 6 tells us that they brought Jason, uh, who was the owner of the home where Paul and Silas were staying, and some of the other believers, uh, and he brought them before the city authorities. So this is the upper level um, of the, the uh, Thessalonican government. Um, and these leaders there were called the polytarchs. Uh, polytarchs, there's a fun word to learn, Caleb, polytarch. Okay, now the polytarchs were, were not only political leaders, political authorities, but they were also religious leaders with religious authority. And like all societies of that time, they were what we know as being sacral in nature, which means that the society was held together by not only the um, civil government, but also by the religious government, uh, uh, to which all the members of the, of the city were, and of that society, had to pay allegiance. That's what kept their economy going, the union of, state, of the state and religion. Okay, and the state religion, of course, uh, of the empire was the worship of Caesar. Although there were other sponsored uh, pagan gods that were, were official um, religions uh, of Caesar. And they existed in, in uh, Thessalonica as well. But the Roman cult, imperial cult, um, with all of the other pagan deities, they bound the empire together and created solidarity among its people. Because Thessalonica was a major port on the most used highway that connected the citizens of the empire, not only to Rome, but also to Mount Olympus, where all the Greek gods existed. It catered to every kind of god and consequently brought a lot of money into the city. So you want to make sure that nothing interferes with the religious activity of the city because you would lose money. Everything comes down to money. To attack the cult and its deity was equivalent then to an attack on the community itself and could result in mob violence, which of course Luke tells us is what happened. It's in this city setting then that Paul and his fellow missionaries brought the gospel. Now I want you to look at some things in Acts chapter 17. So please turn, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. In verse 1 of chapter 17, Paul tells us, it tells us that when Paul arrived in the city of Thessalonica, he began his ministry by first going where? What does it say? The to the Jewish synagogue, exactly. And that was his common practice. He always started out um, going to the synagogues and, uh, and preaching Christ there. Verse 2 tells us that he reasoned with them from the scriptures. So in other words, he used the Old Testament scriptures to prove to the Jews that the Messiah must suffer and die before being raised from the dead by God. Uh, this, of course, was not standard, a standard belief among the Jews, but pr and presumably then he would link this to the historical Jesus and uh, his, his life of miracles and things like this in order to demonstrate that Jesus was in fact the promised Messiah. So verse 4 tells us that, that some of them were persuaded. And I want you to focus there on the word some. Some of the Jews, some of those who attended the synagogue were persuaded. Now that doesn't sound like a very victorious ministry. And it really wasn't from this point of view. It, but it also tells us that Paul's primary success was not among the Jews of the, of the synagogue, but among the devout Greeks. 
Now, the devout Greeks were, were, um, um, were Gentiles who were disillusioned with their own society, with all of the pagan gods and with the, the worship of, uh, of the Caesars. They were disillusioned with, with the way society was going, and the only other alternative they had was the life that was offered by the Jews. And so they would join them in the synagogue to worship God and to learn about life from them. And specifically, it tells us that, uh, his, uh, that it was among the leading women that Paul had the greatest influence with the gospel. Now, the women would not have been allowed into the synagogue, uh, but they were um, uh, leading women, so they were wives of, uh, of politicians, and of authorities, men with authority in the city. So Acts 17 places the focus of Paul's missionary work solely in the synagogue, but First and Second Thessalonians tell us nothing of his ministry among the Jews, which is quite interesting. Uh, in fact, First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, it focuses in on the population of Gentiles as the largest group um, that responded to the gospel. It, it says there, you turn to God from idols. This is not describing the devout Greeks who attended the synagogue. The, they had, the devout Greeks had already turned from idols and they joined the synagogue. Um, but these are, are Gentiles who turned to God from the idols. Uh, the ordinary man on the street. And um, um, this is where Paul had his greatest ministry. The Acts account also appears to have condensed the details of Paul's stay in Thessalonica. In fact, on the surface, if you look at verse 2 of Acts 17, it would appear there that he only stayed for three Sabbaths, or a maximum, or a minimum, perhaps, of 15 days. Uh, so if you take three Sabbaths and the days in between, that's 15. But 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 9 tells us that while Paul was there, that he also found himself a job. He established himself in a trade, and, uh, uh, and he worked among the Thessalonians. Um, and uh, in, this, in his workplace then became the setting where he proclaimed the gospel of God. We also know from Philippians chapter 4 verses 15 and 16 that Paul was there long enough to receive financial aid from the Christians in Philippi on at least two occasions. All of this together would tell us that he was there a lot longer than 15 days. Uh, it was more likely that Paul was in Thessalonica for three or probably closer to four months. And, uh, and in that four months, he and his fellow missionaries spent a lot of time not in the synagogue. They, he was there in the synagogue for three times, but he had very little refute. Only some were saved, but a great multitude were saved by his working in the workplace. So when he went to work, he shared the gospel. When he went to the market to buy his food, he shared the gospel. When he was in the homes of, of uh, some of the converts, they would invite people who were interested in his message to come and talk with him. And so his whole life then was uh, talking with them while he worked, while he lived, and while he entertained. And that sounds like a pattern for you and I, doesn't it? Uh, that uh, that we, can, we can certainly be missionaries the same as Paul. It made sense, of course, that Paul would use the Old Testament scriptures to prove that Jesus is the Messiah to the Jews, but not to the Gentiles. Um, what he would have told the Gentiles is that there is only one God. They lived in a pluralistic society of many gods. And he would have told them that, no, we believe in one God and one God alone. He would have talked to them about sin and uh, uh, of the coming day of judgment, uh, that God would judge them for their sin. He would have told them about Jesus and about his birth and his life and his death and his resurrection and his ascension. Not as the fulfillment of Jewish expectation, but as the one who can deliver them from divine judgment against the sin in this present age. That's how the difference would be between presenting the gospel to Jews and to Gentiles. 
The success of the gospel then was that they talked to people about their biblical worldview while they lived it among the people. Now I just want you to look at 1 Thessalonians 1.5 for a second. There it says, our gospel came to you not only in word, okay, we, we did say it, uh, they talked about the gospel to the people, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. The Holy Spirit was doing the bulk of the regenerating work. We're not responsible for the results, in other words. God is. But what are we responsible for? We're responsible for the speaking part, right? So the, first, the book of 1 Thessalonians, as you know, the, our, our theme is stand firm, Jesus is coming. Um, and, and what it really is, it's really a manual about how to be a disciple of Jesus. And, uh, and in the first part, it tells us of the ministry of the gospel, and then the ministry of follow-up, and the ministry of discipleship, and then the ministry of fellowship. So that's how we're going to proceed when we go through the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians. The ministry of the gospel, follow-up, discipleship, and fellowship. And we're going to make a lot of applications of how we can apply that to our own lives. Now, before, before I go on to our last point, uh, I don't have a clock here, so I don't know what time it is. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> before I go on to my last point, I do want to make one more comment about, what, comment about why the Gentiles in Thessalonica were interested in becoming Christians when it was obvious to them uh, that to do so would create tension within their own society and with their fellow citizens. As Acts 17.6 says, they turned the world upside down. Um, and, and, and I'm going to develop this more fully when, uh, from the text as we move ahead into to talking about the gospel part, particularly in, the, in chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians. But one of the reasons why they were attracted to the gospel is because they were disillusioned with their society. They were disillusioned with society. Uh, and we need to understand that they were not converted instantaneously. Now, some people are converted instantaneously. You share the gospel, and you invite them to Christ, and they pray right then and there. But the majority of people, it's not instantaneous. It, it is over time. It's a process. And um, um, they were re converted by a process which is known as the process of re-socialization in which they engaged with Christians who had a new understanding of life, who lived an alternative social world, uh, on the one hand, that crushes the social world that they live in, and on the other hand, replaces it with another social community called the Ecclesia. <laughs> All right. All right. So we're going to just work that, those things out in more detail. The gospel, in other words, would change the hearts of people, um, which would turn society upside down or upside right, whichever way you look at it, uh, and, uh, and their society would change. And the changing of that society from the hearts of individuals um, uh, has a long-term effect. In fact, historically, we can look at this, and we understand that this is the only reason um, why... Um, um, Christianity grew so rapidly in the whole empire world. And it was about near, it brought about, um, this alone is what brought about the near demise of the Roman Empire and caused Constantine himself to embrace Christianity, which would have saved the empire uh, had he not made Christianity the state religion. The moment he did that, he ruined the whole society uh, and the influence and effect of the gospel. Today, of course, we live in an age where people are, are disillusioned with uh, society in which we live. I mean, look at all of, the, all of the stuff that is happening, particularly south of the border. Uh, all of this is, is reflective of their disillusionment of, uh, of society and of governments. And, and this makes them very ripe for the gospel. But the choices that are being offered to them are either liberty or socialism. Uh, and and uh, we need to offer them a third option. 
Uh, the Ecclesia of Christ needs to become uh, more vocal. They need to bring the gospel to them in word and example. We counter leftist indoctrination by living and sharing the gospel. The biblical worldview and Christian and, and the Christian community is the only view that can save us now. And the message that Paul brings to us through this book and this situation in Thessalonica <coughs> is that we cannot privatize our faith. We cannot privatize our faith. We must be salt and light. We must be the ecclesia of God. All right, in our final moments here, let's turn to our third point, which is the greeting. The greeting, so Paul, Sabanus, and Timothy uh, to the ecclesia of Thessalonians in God, the Father, and the, our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, grace and to you and peace. This is the greeting. Grace to you and peace. Peace. So let me just make a, first a couple comments about grace and why Paul would include it here. Grace, again, is, is a foundational word uh, in Christian vocabulary. You should all know and understand what grace is. We are saved by grace and grace alone. Uh, the word reminds us of our sinful state, that we neither deserve to be saved nor are entitled to be saved. There's another word that is being thrown around today in, in, by those who are disillusioned with society. With society. They say that people are entitled. Uh, and uh, nobody should be entitled to anything. Well, in God's economy, we do, are not entitled to be saved. Grace is the moral attribute of God that describes God when he shows his favor or his love or his goodness uh, or his patience towards people when they deserve to be shown his wrath, his hate, his justice, and his immediate uh, judgment. Uh, it is said that justice is getting what you deserve, while mercy is not getting what you deserve, and grace is getting what you don't deserve. Some people may think that, of course, that they can earn God's favor through good works or, or through some kind of penance. And most of the religions of this world are built on, on a, a system of penance, of trying to earn your salvation. And grace reminds us that we cannot earn our salvation. We don't deserve it, we're not entitled to it, nor can we earn it. The Thessalonians uh, certainly understood this, uh, in, in the, uh, the value of this by buying the, the good favor of all of the gods that they worship. Uh, but a works religion soon leaves you feeling empty and unfulfilled. And th that's why disillusionment begins to, to take over. If grace can be earned, then it's no longer grace, but it's wages. And of course, Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, when they heard that God sent his divine son to bear the punishment that they deserved and that God will turn his favor toward them if they put their faith and trust in Jesus alone for their salvation, then they were ready to receive it. And, and, and it comes down to us today that if you have not yet done so, you can be made right with God by putting your faith in Jesus Christ right now. You can ask God to forgive you of your sins and place your faith and trust in what Jesus accomplished in dying in your place. And God will show his grace towards you in forgiving you of your sins, something we do not deserve. So in addition to uh, grace is not only God's gift of salvation for us in Christ, but grace is also the um, part of God's work in us to enable us to live the Christian life. It's, it's the power that we have to live the Christian life. It, it's also the power to help us to be able to, to live through the circumstances of life that are hard and difficult. Uh, so we ask God for, for grace and we ask God for mercy when we go through the hardships of life. Uh, the community of believers 
who, according to 2.12, walk in a manner worthy of God, collectively have with the gospel all that is required to turn the world upside down. And that's really what it is all about. You see, our walk in, as Christians in this world, along with the gospel, is the power that, uh, that can turn the world for Christ. So here we have his greeting here is one of reminder, but it is also one of promise and a blessing. So the other word that he uses in the greeting is the word peace. Now we know that peace is not just the absence of conflict, but it also is, is wholeness. So when we are whole, when we are complete, when we are fulfilled, we are at peace. And how do we get that? Well, Romans 5.1 tells us that since we have been justified, justification is something that we don't deserve, uh, so it's given to us by grace. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So peace defines our relationship with God. We are God's people, we are his sheep, we are his children, we are his called out ones. Jesus paid the debt of our sins, and our sins will never again be brought against us by God. We have been reconciled, we have been justified by God. We are at peace with God. And what does verse 1 say is our relationship to God? He is God our Father. Our Father. God our Father. Do you need I say more? He goes from our judge to being our Father. And what's our relationship according to this verse to Jesus Christ? He is Lord. the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, Jesus is his name. And Jesus means Savior or he who saves. Uh, the Lord and Christ are titles that express our new relationship with him. As Lord, he is the king, he is the ruler, he is the sovereign God who is in charge of this world. It reminds us that he is sitting on the throne right now and that he is sovereignly in charge. And that is the greatest comfort in these troublesome times. The title Christ means anointed and is another word for Messiah. But as the anointed one, he is in heaven as our high priest interceding for us every day. It reminds us also that he is coming again to finish his work of deliverance and to bring judgment upon his enemies, which is another message in the books of Thessalonians. What is our relationship with one another? According to this verse, we are called the, the church or the ecclesia, the called out ones. The ecclesia is not made up of individuals isolated from one another, uh, from each other. You, you can't see this in, the, in our English Bible, of course, but the word in Greek is actually in the singular. The, the word ecclesia, it's in the singular. Uh, the ecclesia is one whole community that is made up of all who have been called out. It is one body made up of many believers. It is Paul, it is Sylvanus, it is Timothy, it is each one of us baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. We are uniquely related through Jesus. And we belong to a new kingdom that one day will make its full entrance into this world. And the kingdoms of this world will bow down to it. With the gospel and the Christian community, God has placed within this world a powerful weapon to transform this world for Jesus Christ. First one, Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father, and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. I'm reminded of Romans 11.33. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. Who knew that there was so much in one verse? May God's grace and peace be with you all.